Family-owned theme parks are quite a rare breed around the world. Enchanted Forest is one of these few. Many family-owned theme parks share similar beginnings, but this one has a story all the more unique. Just like the little engine that could, Enchanted Forest just keeps on going. Despite all of their challenges, this park has managed to not only make it through the tough times, but thrive through them. If you've ever found yourself driving north up Highway 5 in Oregon, eventually you might have come across a sign that says Exit 248 Enchanted Forest Theme Park. Then, shortly after that, you would have seen the Enchanted Forest sign and the little Bavarian themed facade facing outwards. Some of you may have been a bit curious as to what exactly this place is. To others, this may have been a fleeting thought of, oh, that looks cute, only to fade away into distant memory. If you are one of the people who actually does stop here, you've quickly come to realize that this little place on the side of the road has so much to offer. Dig a little deeper and you'll find that there is an incredible story behind this quaint little theme park in the middle of Oregon. My dad started this whole thing with just handmade very small things, and then went on to buildings where he's hand sculpting the outside of the building. So it's a very creative, hand-crafted feel. It's not a commercial, smooth, slick feel. And it's small, so it feels very intimate. And I think people come here, it, it's so intimate that I think they feel like they've discovered their own secret special place. And I think that's what makes it special. The same family still owns the Enchanted Forest. The whole family is hands-on. You know, we try to be artistic. You know, so like you can't go to another park and see a storybook land just like ours because we did that ourselves. But I think a big thing is just that we're still a family-owned amusement park, which I know there is very few left in the country. I always feel like there's a lot of care and thought put into every decision because it's not a corporation, there's no board. It's our family making the decisions. My dad bought the land when I was two years old, so I kind of grew up with that. He would bring us all out here and help him build things. <laughs> but it was more like us kids mixing the cement with our hands, you know, playing around, you know. I asked dad the other day, I, I was saying that, that I think, I said, yeah, you know, I imagine when you brought us out as, there as little kids on the weekend or whatever, we got in the way more than anything. And he was saying to me, no, you know, I actually liked having you guys out there. So, you know, it's probably some company or whatever. Back in 1964, traveled back to Minnesota to see the relatives. On the way, I seen a few little parks. There wasn't much to them, so then that's kind of how I got my idea. So when I got back, I started looking for some land here. The realtor showed me some land just north of here, and then I looked at that and, and across the valley here and told him if I could only get that over here, that would be great. He says, well, I don't know, but a week later he called me and came by where I worked at, at that time at the State Highway. And so he drove out here and he showed me the land and he said it was 20 acres for $4,000. So I managed to scrape, I think, $500 down and then paid him every month $50. And the way I financed it was I did 
uh, watch repairing for a lot of the state workers and anybody. Fix the watch, I'd buy a sack of cement or something and come out here and start working. Pumpkin was the first thing, just a small project. But I did build a swimming pool at home, so I had a little experience on cement, but not too much on the sculpting. But that's why I did the pumpkin first. And then from there, I went to the witch and different things. And at the time when I started, I thought, well, maybe it'd take me a year or two, but kept dragging on. And then finally at 71, in 71, we decided to open it up. He worked all the time on it. When he wasn't working at his other three jobs, he was out here on the weekends, after work. Every once in a while, we got to come out with him. I would hear other people talking about this crazy man who crashed his plane, started building witches' heads and things. That is my dad they're talking about. I think that made him even more determined to make it work out and give it his best. I was pretty sure it'd work, so I kept plugging away. When I used to work at the highway department, I remember some of them would start kidding me, ask me how Idiot Hill is coming along or the, how the funny farms do. People kept discouraging me. That motivated me, I think, all the more. I remember an argument between my mom and dad after he'd been building for, I think, two years. And he was saying, oh, I've got nothing to show for it and everything. And my mom had not been on board up until that time. She was on board as far as you can do it as long as you keep your job. But now she was like really on board because it's, no, you've got to finish this. Otherwise you won't forgive yourself, finish it, see what happens. I don't think either one of them knew that they still had five more years to go. I had some friends that worked uh, with me down the highway They'd come out once in a while on weekends and help me a little bit. But basically, I'd come out here after work and on weekends, work uh, as I could almost every day. I couldn't hardly get anybody convinced that my relatives or anybody thought it was a crazy idea. Most of the stuff was him. Uh, later on, my grandfather, um, he helped to do some of the construction until he couldn't work anymore. So from time to time he would get help, but he did a lot of the building and construction just by himself. He had two great friends that would come out with him every once in a while on the weekends, you know, because there were some things where you just need people to help lift, you know, you, you need some other people. I think it was Jerry Manis and John Davenport. They would come out and help him. And, you know, were they building the whole park with him? No but they definitely did help in those initial years and I think we're just great camaraderie for my dad so he wasn't all alone. The day we opened and the days leading up to it, I think I was 14 then, old enough to know what's going on. I remember my mom talking to my dad because we're toward the end of July now, we're still not open another year and I remember her saying, what is it going to take to get open? And he had this list, well, the entrance building needs to be cleaned out. You know, he had this whole list of things. And then mom said, okay, I'm getting the kids. We're all going to make that happen. And I just remember, you know, this list of things, and we would just go together as a family while dad was doing his stuff and work on that and help in our small way. And then, yeah, they stuck that piece of butcher paper saying open on the fence on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon and we were open. So the day we opened, I think they had 75 people or something. But then an article came out in the paper and the next weekend, we had like a thousand people. I think we charged 50 cents for children and a dollar for adults. So when we went home, all of the money was in dollar bills. And I remember all of us children hopping up and down on mom and dad's bed and throwing the money around and so ecstatic that, you know, it was off the ground. Everybody was happy. We've never run a business before. We are so naive. 
we do not know that that money is not ours. <laughs> you know, it's going to go really fast toward all the expenses and everything else involved in it. But I do remember that real joy of uh, just throwing the money around on the bed and we were open and we were there and it was taking off. It wasn't long before waves of visitors flooded in, drawn by the allure of a real life fairy tale. Here, amidst the towering trees and winding paths, families found themselves transported into a world of fantasy and adventure. Roger's passion for storytelling and attention to detail brought the entire forest to life, captivating the hearts and imaginations of visitors both young and old. In short order, Enchanted Forest became the destination for families to visit during the summer. Although the park hasn't seen attendance numbers as large as other theme parks in the country, it has rooted itself in the hearts of the families who visit each year. When one generation who visited this park as kids grows up, they will often bring the next generation to experience the same sense of wonder they felt many years before. Of course, my dad started, then my mom, and at the time, then my mom's father worked for a while in construction, then her brother, my uncle, worked in construction for years and years and years until just recently. And then, of course, we had four kids, all of who worked in the business. Once we got open, then we all worked here as kids. Now, the remaining family members are Susan and I, we're co-managers, and then our kids. So there's my son, Tim, works here, and then his wife, Ashley, works here, and then Sue's son, Derek, works here. He's head of maintenance. And then my dad occasionally comes out, and he kind of likes just strolling around and giving us ideas. <laughs> and then now we have some of our grandkids starting to work. Not yet, but there will be one turning of age pretty soon, so then I'm sure she'll want to start working too. And so there'll be a total of four generations then working in the park. Um, so working in a family owned business, it sounds like kind of scary, but it's actually really good. Like I have been here for a while and like any concern I have, especially with safety for the ride, I can just go to them and say, hey, this is what's going on. They listen to you, they respect you. They'll fix whatever needs to be fixed because they do take it seriously because they really love the park and they really want to see it grow and succeed. And so that's, you really get the feel of that. So the way it works between management that's in the family and not in the family, I'm a little unique in a way because I married into the family. But I always felt like they've done a really good job. I feel like everyone's opinion is valued in management. I feel like we can all speak openly to try to problem solve and figure things out. And I feel like the people that aren't family that are in management have the same respect and value that the people in the family do. Overall, we get along really, really great because we all have our own area that we're in charge of. So most of the times we're not stepping on each other's toes and we do collaborate pretty well. It's kind of nice working with the family because we are always up on everything. You know, we know each other's business. You know? <laughs> I feel really lucky because the park is big enough that we have our own separate areas. Like I would never dream of telling Mary what to do in accounting, all the food service areas or anything like that. She wouldn't dream of stepping into my music or theater area. Maintenance, you know, Derek is great at that. And I think, yes, we butt heads in a family way. You know, when there's a disagreement, I think it's different when you're in the family business because you talk way more directly. I guess you talk raw when you have a disagreement. 99% of the time, we're thankful we get along great, but I just think when there's a disagreement, the conversation is a little more direct. <laughs> a lot of people ask us, because we're seasonal, when you're done for the year, you must get all this time off. And it's actually not like that at all. So the moment we close, we are starting to take apart the ride. Because the moment you close, you've only got six months. 
So there's like, there's a definite time where we need all the stuff put back together. I'm on the stuff like painting, all the construction, all of those sort of things during the winter, which, you know, that's from the second we close to the second we open. There is no break during the winter. Other people can talk to this, but of course they're going through all the manuals, all of the figures for the year, the training, the hiring, because that starts fairly early. So they can talk about what they do, but as far as, as me, it's, it's all of that winter maintenance visual for how the park looks and construction and then uh, getting ready for what play am I going to do, <laughs> revamping that, auditioning, all of that. So during the off season, I do a lot of office work. I do some help with the bookkeeping. I'll answer the emails and phone calls. I go over all our training sheets and safety stuff to see if there's anything that needs to be updated or changed. And then when we get around to the next year, I, it's just preparing to open, hiring, training, all that stuff. I support a lot in the stock room area. At the beginning of the season, we do a lot of cleaning. Like we try to protect things during the off season, but because of the rain and the cold, once we start getting open for the season, there's a lot of cleaning, a lot of scrubbing walls and everything like that. So there's a lot of that. The moment we close, we're draining log ride. We're taking apart the ice mountain boat trains to every last bolt comes off. We get those inspected. We do NDT on certain parts of the coasters. We do our track out there. Yeah, we're busy. And that's the time too where all these other things around the park that we can't work on while they're open, like maybe animatronics or certain things like that that are really hard to get into while there's customers there. That's when we'll go gut it and refurbish it and start working on that. So there's certain kinks like that you'll have to get through a season with as long as it's not safety. But if it's like, I don't like how that animatronic's running right now, well, some of that has to wait till the winter time because you've got to concentrate on this stuff first. But yeah, we're busy during the off season and it's, it's tricky to not forget that, you know, <laughs> stay on top of your stuff. As a result of being such a small and tightly knit group, different hats are worn by several of the park staff to ensure that all of the work that needs to be done during the off season can be completed in a timely manner. From its early days and beyond, Enchanted Forest found itself in a comfortable niche Finances were stable and there were plans to expand. In fact, in 2019, land to the north of the park had been purchased for development of future attractions. COVID kind of forced us to rethink things about what was priority to us. We kind of switched back to, okay, let's maintain what we got and start investing money into what's here and making that better, but also concentrating on being able to keep our important employees employed if that were to ever happen again. We had to let a lot of people go. For a while, during the winter time, like doing all this stuff, it was just me and Henry. During certain parts, you're not allowed to work with anybody. So it'd be like, all right, you take apart this as much as you can, and then we'll mask up and do the two-person part. So it was a ghost town for me and Henry. We had to start all over building a crew again. We're still feeling the effects of not being able to get certain things like our frog hopper is down right now and we can't get certain parts. We are trying to, but we can, you know, we can't run it till we get the right parts. So that's, that's one of the biggest headaches. It was pretty tough. Even with the park being closed, they were trying their best to figure out any solution they could come up with where we could open at all. With the limited time and the amount of people we could have, trying to fit everybody that we could who wanted to come to the park to be able to come to the park, it was kind of tough. Where we ha would have to turn people away because we were only allowed so many people in the park. So that was pretty tough. We did get a lot of support from the entire community. It really helped us get through. It was definitely really difficult times day to day. We're only allowed 200 guests in the park. It feels very strange. We weren't making any money, but we wanted to be open. When the community just kept messaging us and wanting to help, wanting to donate, wanting to do things to keep us going, it just felt really nice that we were such a strong part of the community. And I want to continue to be part of the community that, you know, just a positive place to come. The collaboration we had, because 
we were all in the same spot in that of theme parks, amusement parks were designated, kind of a special designation where you just could not open. But places like the zoo were allowed to open. So when I'm talking to the governor's office and everything, I'm like, you know, what's the difference between them and us? We're outdoors. It was actually the zoo that I had the most interaction with. The Oregon Zoo opened their arms to me and showed me a lot of their stuff, showed me the plans they made. Between conversations with the governor's office and the zoo, that's where we kind of finally worked our way through it in the best possible way we could under the circumstances. The restrictions were harsh, but Enchanted Forest was surviving. Budgets were being stretched paper thin, but there was still strong hope for the future. countless memories for kids, but now the Enchanted Forest south of Salem is dealing with a second natural disaster in just six months time. Check out the As if 2020 wasn't difficult enough, Mother Nature comes in to display its power. On February 12, 2021, the Tofty family and the rest of the employees came to the park to see this. Massive trees toppled over, which damaged large parts of the park. When we first showed up the day of the, or the day after the ice storm, however you want to phrase it, even the parking lot, there was trees down in the parking lot there. A big one had fallen over our main gate. So again, before we could kind of get into the park, we had to chainsaw stuff up. Uh, it really took us a while to understand how bad it was. You know, we didn't even make it up to the kitty train for a while <laughs> to know that that was all smashed. I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, you know, this isn't so bad. And then after a few days of it, you're like, this is bad, you know? You know, there's big, huge trees that fell and it would bring up the whole sidewalk, even around the lower trail, the whole sidewalk came up. The night, that it happened, I got a call from the fire department because um, they have my number and everything, saying that uh, the alarm was going off in Maunder that water was flowing. That's what they told me. I said, well, water is not flowing. You know, it's like freezing weather and everything. And I said, probably a broken pipe. One of our EMTs here, uh, one of the medics works on the Turner Fire Department. And so I called her and said, when you get out there, shoot me video so I know what's going on out there. It was horrible. Just, I could just tell trees were down. Everything was super bad. Um, we weren't able to travel yet on the roads, but I immediately, and this is really early in the morning, I immediately texted every contractor we work with and said, I don't know exactly what's happened, but it's really, really bad we need to get on your list for repairs. It was like the night of, and you could, like at your own house, you could hear the trees cracking. And like in my mind, I was like, oh, this is scary. And then I was like, oh man, the forest. And so then you just, you know, picture what's happening at your house where there's a few trees and then imagining what's going on. It, it, and the one thing after the ice storm was it took us forever just to clear the park out so we could work on the park. It was like days and days and days of, Tons of people out here with chainsaws, just clearing paths so we could get vehicles to certain places. And even that alone took a couple weeks. Every one of those people that we work with all the time, you know, big construction companies, roofing companies, um, all of those people, they were all out here immediately Monday morning, even though we had still no power for a whole week, and they were all working immediately. The main other kicker with that besides damage and stuff like that is how far it put us behind on winter maintenance. Because like I said, it's not that you don't have any spare time, it's that, you know, generally the winter time is where you're trying to really gut things and find those things. So you may go like, oh, well, we do need to replace everything on this lift. That's okay, because we have time. Well, then the ice storm happens, he goes, 
and you're, and you're just thinking, well, now we don't have any extra time. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. It's, it's just work. It's so much, so much work. You know you can do it, and you know you've got to move really fast, and you've got to just get right at it. We knew we had a long ways to go, but there's just that determination that you just have to get to work, and it will get done. Yeah, it's how do we fix this? We really feel like as a family and especially with the other team members we have that we can come together and figure it out and we'll do whatever has to be done to keep going. And I feel like we've always had that attitude. We've had lots of issues and things that we've faced, especially in the last four or five years. And I honestly feel like our attitude is always to support each other and brainstorm on how to fix it. What's next? What can we do? And just moving forward. I definitely find all of that attitude very inspiring. I've always felt working here that it's always about moving forward and problem solving and, you know, not letting anything take you out, take you down, and you just keep going and support each other. I think it changed our whole business philosophy for one thing, because we had been on a real upswing in the park and we had plans. We were set to pull, to pull the trigger and we were going to build a whole new big roller coaster. Now, had we had a loan out for several million dollars, we would not be here. I don't care how many people helped us, we could not have made it through COVID. We were lucky we didn't have any of those loans out. So for the future, we wanna make sure we're in a position that it's gonna take a lot for us to go under. Everything will be thought through very carefully before expanding. And we will expand, but more carefully <laughs> than the plans were right before COVID. Despite the severe challenges, Enchanted Forest was able to persevere. Due to the resilience of the Tofty family, the park was almost in tip-top shape when it reopened for the season. This return to form was in large part aided by the outside support received during these hard times. A lot of people helped. It was mostly in monetary contributions or people working with us to put off some of our bills a while and let us have longer to pay, people buying bricks, people. We had auctions, we auctioned off my dad's artwork, memorabilia, because what we needed was money. We had to pay our bills, so it really came down to money. I really think that was the main thing people helping us financially because we're a business we can't really let we had offers of people to donate time and everything but we have heavy construction equipment in here rebuilding after all this you just can't let people in even though their heart is in the right place I would say the other thing is how they supported us with their good wishes and and that sounds like that's not a lot but that was huge because so many people, even with the GoFundMe, you know, they would be giving $5. Some people gave a lot, but a lot of people, the majority of people is $5, $10. And there were all of these notes with it, all these things about this was my childhood. It meant so much to me. I want to make sure this is here for my grandchildren. We love this park. You know, I just get, I get choked up when I think about it because I don't think had COVID not happened, I don't think we would realize how invested people were in the park and how deeply it really meant something to them, enough that they were willing to help us stay here. That's like, that's, that's really huge. As soon as we put the GoFundMe out there, people start donating and people even sent us money, you know, through checks or they came out here with money and saying, oh, we don't want this park to go away because, you know, it has a lot of special memories and we can't lose this. Please stay open. I mean, we were just so surprised, so humbled, so overwhelmed by all the support and all the love that all of our uh, guests or fans or people that just love the park 
just came out of the woodwork. You know, we had no idea that they, all that those people supported us in that way. And we just thank everybody from the bottom of our hearts because if we didn't get that, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah, that was uh, tremendous. Uh, we've had a lot of support from the community. It just took us about two or three months to haul everything, but we managed to open up the season when we were scheduled. So the money we raised through GoFundMe was around $500,000, and then we also raised a lot of money through the Buy a Brick program, individual donations from people, selling memorabilia online. It ended up working out. We persevered. The community is really what saved our butts. The locals around here are, are just too good to us, and there's some pride in that too because they started a GoFundMe to just do anything that helped. They raised a bunch of money for us, and they really helped us make it through that. It's kind of more important for us now after COVID to concentrate on making what we got better and making sure the customers are happy. To have grown so close with my grandpa and my family and just be able to see, I was glad that my grandpa was able to see something like that. The community rally around us and see how much it meant to the community. For me to get to see my grandpa kind of see that, it was really awesome. And, and to know that people really truly want us here and care about it, that doesn't get any cooler than that. And that feels really good. We started out right for a family built theme park. My parents definitely did not believe in getting into debt. So I think that saved us through all of that initial growing of the business because they never overextended themselves. And I think it would be so easy for somebody to come in, take out big loans, and then not be able to pay that off because the business doesn't go quickly enough or, or there's delays. We have taken out loans a couple of times to build big projects, but by that time we were pretty experienced in what we were doing. But I, I think I, I give a great deal of thanks to my parents for starting off very small and slowly working up to a larger business. It's like farming in that you can only bring in revenue during the good weather. We have the climate here. We can't be open all year round like you could in Southern California. So it's always a challenge when you have a bad winter where it's raining, which is most of the time. And so things like painting, refurbishing, it's, it's always a challenge. And we're doing extremely creative things to get things done in that environment. You know, you may build an outside building to something just to be able to re-cement it when it's pouring down rain or something. It's always the unexpected because everything keeps changing, the park keeps growing, and every time you grow, there's new problems. But it's that unexpected as we saw in COVID, the ice storm, and I think we've learned over time because we went through another big storm, I don't know, 20 years before that, and it gave us that experience of going through something where there were a lot of repairs needed. Not like the other one, but a big taste of it. It's that ability to just take it in, not be devastated, and just roll with it and just continually think, what do I need to do next? What do I need to focus on next? And, and just keep going at it. It's kind of like building. You just keep doing the next thing and eventually it gets fixed or eventually you get it built. I think the biggest challenge that we face is dealing with safety and customer service at the same time. So there's definitely a lot of safety rules that we follow very strictly and kind of working with guests that might want to do something different, but we really can't let them. So it's kind of finding the balance between that each day. We always train where safety is our number one priority and it's above all else, but we try to still make it fun for our guests. So it's kind of doing that balance where we kind of have to say no at times, especially with people with their first time jobs. It's a really hard thing to do where somebody's like saying, I want to do this and you have to be no. So I think that's the biggest challenge at rides that we have is we sometimes have to say no. For us, we do a lot of preventative. We have two lifts on each ride, chain lifts. 
and we rotate them so every four years that everything's been gutted and replaced. This year we actually did the paddle wheel but when that ride was built nobody ever thought about how you would get equipment over there. They built the ride essentially around the paddle wheel. There's no walkway or anything to get that stuff over there and you're talking gearboxes, hydro shivs, motors, all that sort of stuff that we basically had to set up some winch system and lift it everything over the ride into the air and and just magically get it to the exact spot it needed and so it's stuff like that where it's awesome to show the new guys like hey you you've got to be really safety conscious when you do this stuff but also really creative when you see a problem like that like we can't say oh, it can't be done like you just have to figure out how you're going to do it and do it safely and a lot of times that means getting these things up the hill like last year we made toboggans and just little sleds that we drug everything up the hill with because that's the, I mean we're not carrying it up these things in the middle of winter when it's muddy and, and you're slipping and sliding so really the hardest part about a lot of this is how you're going to get things there or how you're going to fix that stuff frog hopper is a traveling ride that you're, the boom's supposed to be able to come down well they built it in a place where we can't so we have to do the ride while it's all up and that makes it difficult we used to use scaffolding but that wasn't fun uh, so now we rent a big boom lift that is really hard to get up there because we have really small pathways, but it makes it safer and quicker to work on that, right? So it's also kind of evolving with, with the stuff. At least the management will let us go rent things like that and make our job easier. But then too, with the guys, you know, if they come up with something like, hey, this is like 10 times harder than it needs to be. Can we do it like this? I'm not just going to say no. It's like, oh, let's look into that. Let's talk to our ride inspector. Our, our state inspector and, and our engineer and make sure it's okay if we start doing it like this to make our lives easier. I, I take pride in the fact that when we're doing our job right, like you, you, you never notice. And that, you know, when I see th that my guys are like willing to do everything, whether that be plunging the toilet or coming and helping me at the rides and they'll do it with a smile on their face and they'll treat the guests with respect. Watching my crew be an amazing crew makes me almost tear up. Coming from bottom, working my way up, I'm very proud of what I do, and I love when my guys are just as proud. So that's the big payoff, is when you see a guy who actually troubleshot something, did it correctly, communicated with the supervisor the whole time, and he's got a big smile on his face, you're like, you know, that's, that's good. I love, I love when my guys learn more and get better at their job. I think I take the most pride in being the first job for a lot of kids in high school and college and really trying to make it a positive experience for them and a learning experience. I just know like it was my first job and it was it was such a fun experience for me, but I learned a lot about working and things like that and kind of like what the type of people I want to work for and the type of people I don't want to work for. I take a lot of pride in being a really positive experience for a lot of kids. We have a lot of younger team members at work, so it's their first job, so it's kind of fun later if they come back and they say, you know, I just want to say thank you for giving me the first job and I learned a lot about work ethic from you. So that makes me feel good that, you know, I'm hopefully passing on things to other youth as they grow up and become adults. I think it's just trying to make sure not only our guests, but that our, uh, like our ride attendants, our team members go home having a positive experience. For some people, this is their first job. It is a lot. And so if we can make their job as enjoyable as we can, I think it's a big plus for everybody. The idea of seeing all the families come in and enjoying it, that's probably the most satisfaction that we get. Right now, I would say we take particular pride in having survived COVID. I think we feel very proud of how we mentally came through that, that it was hard, but we kept trying different things. You know, we were very proactive, you know, starting the BioBrick program, auctioning off items. I mean, we were just constantly brainstorming, okay, what can we do now? What can we do now? And we didn't assume everything was going to be okay. So we were very active. And one thing about a business like ours, where we don't have a huge board of directors, we can make decisions and turn on a dime really quickly because it's just family making these decisions. And I would say 
for me, I'm really proud of how we navigated all of that. Lots of times if I walk through the storybook area, I see a lot of kids that they're way ahead of their parents. You know, they're like running and the parents are like, wait up for us, because they can't wait to get onto the next thing. They are very excited, you know, they come out of attractions like, oh wow, I just came out of the keyhole at Alice in Wonderland, or I just slid down the slide at the witch's head. They just get very excited. And a lot of it brings back memories of when I was younger, especially the lower storybook area. And, and just to see the little kids, the children that do come, and about how excited they are. I think it's seeing kids having a good time. Even when I've brought younger relatives, just seeing the wonder on their face. And it reminds me kind of what it's like to be a kid and really be able to use your imagination for everything. I think staying young at heart is very important for this job. I think there's a lot of change from day to day. You have to be flexible and think on your feet. I feel like we all just have, have to have a good attitude about everything because you never know what's going to happen out here. I think it's just you come here and every day is different and every day is almost an adventure. Like you never know what's going to happen. And no matter what's going on in your life, there's always somebody's having fun here. And so that really helps you focus on the kiddos are having fun. And that just brings you back to like, oh, this life is fun. <laughs> you kind of have to be young in spirit. Every day we're walking up a hill 5,000 times. So you got to kind of just stay positive. For me, it, I love seeing when a kid comes out of Mondor just like, oh, I'm pumped, you know? And it's like, that is easy for me to feed off that energy because now I'm smiling. I had a kid the other day, I was walking down. I don't know who this, this child is, but he was walking with his family. He pulls these rocks out he got from Panner. He's like, hey, 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 can I show you my rocks? I said, absolutely. So I sat down with him and looked at his rocks and his parents were like, no, no, you don't have to. I was like, no. I'm gonna look at these rocks with this kid. I don't mind, I don't have anywhere to go. So it's it's kind of that like, man, I, I gotta pinch myself sometimes because I love what I do. And I, I think it's awesome that I get to work on rides. I think it's awesome that people wanna come enjoy this. It's easy to have a good time at work, but take it seriously. Everybody gets along. We're, we're constantly joking and having a good time when we're on break. And then when it's, hey, we've got a knee stop, it's like, you drop whatever you do. You can be mid bite of your sandwich and you gotta go. You're really fed by the joy of other people in the park. When you see people really enjoying some aspect of the park, whether it's the theater or the log ride, and, and you hear those things, because you're walking right beside them, you're hearing these reactions, they may not even know who you are, but it's just how much joy they bring to us, and that feeds all the positive nature of this work because, I mean, what a joy it is to just be able to create something. Basically, we have our own playground and we get to dream up whatever we want to dream up and figure out a way to make it work financially, but pretty much you can make something happen. I mean, I just think our family has a lot of the inner child in it because we have the biggest playground to play in too. <laughs> and, and we all love it together when we're in brainstorming sessions or thinking of what we want to do or how to solve a problem, that's really, those are fun, exciting times in the family because we all contribute, we all listen to each other. There's an electricity and excitement about that. And I think we all love the park so much. There's the electricity and excitement in sharing that with each other too. As a kid, I was always creating things. The artistic part, I think, comes into the park a lot too. If it wasn't for the art part of it, I don't think it would be what it is today. Because when I designed it, you know, I'd always look down the trail or things and see kind of like a picture of what they'd imagine when they were walking through. Oh, I think it's just keeping a positive attitude and the enjoyment of being around here and seeing people and developing it and using our creative juices, I guess we'd call it. I would hope that the legacy for Enchanted Forest is that it can continue to be passed through 
the generations of the family. I would love to see it a family enterprise as long as possible where each generation has really learned from the past generations and really buys into what my dad tried to create. And I would love that legacy to be a continuation of my father's original vision, with this uh, really handcrafted creativity in a beautiful forest setting. And I'm hoping that forever that will be able to continue. I hope the legacy of Enchanted Forest will be just a fun, unique park that is for families and not about any commercialism at all. And I don't mind commercialism and I understand the aspects of that business, but I like that we can be different for, so families have a different option. I hope the legacy for the Enchanted Forest is just the continuation of fun and enchantment. It's just such a fun place to come. I bring my nieces and my nephew and they love it and I just want that to continue. Well, I hope it'll just keep growing like it has and well for bringing uh, a lot of families together out here that they can enjoy what we've done. Hopefully it'll grow and continue through the years so everybody can enjoy it. Well, I think the legacy of Enchanted Forest is to continue to entertain people that come here and to pass it down through generations and generations of running it and keep it a family business is my hope. My hope is that you don't notice the changing of hands, basically. I love what my grandpa built and I just want it to, in 50 years, I want people to look at it the same way they did when my mom and aunt were in charge and when my grandpa was still out here working. I'd rather you didn't notice that the next generation took it over. I hope people keep coming and keep smiling. I'd want the legacy to basically be what my grandpa built and what my family has built. And I don't want to come in here and necessarily change anything. I just want to make it safe and clean and better and and really just make sure that we can maximize the experience that people have. My legacy is basically my grandpa's, so I'm just trying to keep that up as best I can, really. I always hope that as the years pass, visitors will remember my father, because I think my father started something that was really crazy. It was just a man with a family who has this idea to build this park, it really was crazy to a lot of people. I heard a lot of people saying how sorry they were for his wife and kids, <laughs> and, and yet he believed and kept going and made it happen. It's that willpower to keep going, keep going, keep going until it gets done, and he, he really worked hard. And this wasn't having the idea and having other people do it for you. He worked hard himself, as we all work hard. So I would hope that my father is remembered for how he created this. The Enchanted Forest born from a dream and nurtured by love, has become an enduring symbol of the magic that lies within our hearts. Today, as it continues to stand as a testament to the power of imagination, its legacy lives on, a timeless reminder that sometimes the most extraordinary success stories emerge from the pages of our favorite fairy tales. Through an ever-present show of persistence, the Tofty family have created and maintained a cultural icon for many of the people in the Pacific Northwest. This is a park that lives off the support received from its visitors and from the level of care the family puts in. Enchanted Forest has been around for just over 50 years, and on August 8th, the park will be celebrating its next anniversary. With everyone's continued support, this park can thrive for the next 50 years. When you do visit, if you ever happen to catch any of the Tofty family walking around the park, make sure to show them appreciation for the work they put into it as well as the impact they've had on their local community. Without their tenacity, this park would not be where it is today. Mm -hmm.